Pastor J.D. Farag, who presented a topic that is a favorite to all of those who follow this ministry, and that would be the imminent rapture of the church, the Bride of Christ. Pastor J.D. Farag is a defender of the pre-trib rapture of the church, believing, as I do, that Jesus Christ would never perpetrate wrath on believers, although he allows man to do so. We are promised tribulation in the world, as it states in John 16, 33, but as it says in Revelation 3, 10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The church then disappears after Revelation 3 as we rejoice with our Lord in heaven and the tribulation plays out on earth. Let's head right on over to Pastor J.D. Farag with his message on the rapture. Well, aloha. See, I love that. So I had the uh, privilege of meeting some of you out front when I hijacked Amir's table. Not the first time an Arab has hijacked something belonging to the Jew. (laughs) But I don't feel bad at all, and I'll tell you why. So this morning... He hijacked a lot of what I was going to (laughs) say. I forgive you. I have to. And uh, so I cannot even begin to tell you how much of a privilege it is. I am so honored to be here with you today. And I was able to meet so many of you out front and then also up here. And I'm hoping to be able to meet more of you if the Lord presents that opportunity this afternoon or before we leave tonight. I had a lot of people ask me, so, what's up with the suit? (laughs) Well, here's the thing with the suit, okay? In Hawaii, you really never get to wear a suit unless you're doing a memorial service or a wedding. And so I thought, you know, this is going to be great because I'm going to actually be able to wear clothes when I'm there, right? So I think I clean up okay, yeah? My wife thought so. She said, oh, we've been married for 29 years and pray for her. (laughs) So she couldn't be with me. And uh, she uh, wants me to give you uh, her love. And she said, I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to let you go and uh, (laughs) minister to the people. So, (laughs) again, it's such an honor to be here with you. Just cannot thank Jan enough, again, for all that she's done and uh, how God has used her so mightily over the years. Well, you see there on the screen... I get to talk about my favorite subject and topic in all the world, (laughs) the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm really looking forward to what the Lord has, and so if you don't mind, I want to get right to it, have so much that I believe the Lord has put on my heart to share with you. I truly believe with all my heart that not only can the rapture of the church happen at any time, but that it's actually closer than any of us might realize. I think of what Jesus said about how that he would come at a time when we expect not. In other words, it can happen at any time. I love how one did a play on words regarding the doctrine, the sound doctrine of imminence, and said imminence can be best understood this way. It can happen any minute. Did you catch that? I'll do it again. (laughs) The rapture is imminent. It can happen at any minute. I'm going to make a statement. I've shared it before, and I suppose this is probably as good of a time as any to share it again. And please know that when I say this, I 
I'm being honest and it's not hyperbole. I'm just speaking from my heart to yours that were it not for the blessed hope of the imminent return of Jesus Christ for his bride, I would literally go out of my mind. I have to say that as Michelle was sharing, I just, how heartbreaking is that? How heartbreaking is what is taking place in the world today? So what I want to do is, in no particular order, I just want to share quickly. Oh, I better watch the clock here. So I'm going to take my watch off. It reminds me of another story. Don't worry, Michelle, this will be fast. It won't be two minutes. (laughs) So the uh, pastor gets up to the pulpit, takes his watch off, and the son, sitting with his father, asks him, so what does it mean when the pastor takes his watch off? To which his father replied, absolutely nothing. (laughs) So uh, I'm watching it now, and so what follows are seven reasons that We can and should, as Jesus said in Luke's Gospel 21, 28, to look up and lift up our heads knowing that our redemption draws nigh. And I want to begin with this first one, which I think is in some ways first and foremost, but I'm going to have to just ask you to kindly allow me to proceed with the presupposition that you're all well-versed on the prophetic scriptures. I'll just simply, in the interest of time, refer to many of them. I'm doing this for the purpose of saving as much time as I can at the end to really share something the Lord has been ministering to me as of late. So much is happening so fast, wouldn't you agree? It's the likes of which we've really never seen before in human history, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to understand the times and, like the men of Issachar, know what to do. The clarion call is to know that not only are we living in the last moments of world history as we know it, but we need to know what to do while there's still time. So let's start with this first one, and it's this increasing mocking and ridiculing of the Lord's return, but more specifically, the rapture, and even more specifically, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. It has come under such satanic attack, and when I say satanic attack, I mean satanic attack. What do we know to be true about the enemy? He is the father of lies. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the author of confusion. And so what is happening now, I believe, concerning the pre-tribulation rapture is this increasing attack on the sound doctrine. I don't call it the pre-tribulation rapture theory. It's not a theory. This is a sound doctrine and truth from the pages of Holy Writ. I suppose in some ways we shouldn't be surprised. This is actually a sign in and of itself. The Apostle Peter in his second epistle wrote chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 and told us that scoffers will come in the last days. And interesting, they'll be walking according to their own lusts, and they'll say very sarcastically, where's the promise of his coming? Everybody has thought he was going to come in their lifetime, and yet he doesn't come. Everything goes on as it has from the beginning of creation. I hate to say it, but I have to say it. It's going to get worse. As we near that time when that trumpet sounds, it's going to get worse. If you just joined me, I'm playing a message given by Pastor J.D. Farag, Why the Rapture Can Happen at Any Time. This was given at Understanding the Times 2017 back on October the 7th.
Well, again, I want to move very quickly. The second reason that I believe the rapture can happen at any time has to do with what I see as this insatiable quest for peace and security. Some of your translations render it safety. It's the same word in the Greek, asphalia, which can be translated either safety or security. But you just about can't watch a news report or read an article without hearing those two words. And you see it there on the screen this year at the UN. I appreciate it very much what Michelle shared about the UN. And, but this year's UN General Assembly, the theme was together for peace, respect, safety, and dignity for all. And this was on September 21st, and it was dubbed the International Day of Peace at the United Nations in New York. I happened to be there right before you were there, Michelle. I was there for a, a different reason. My daughter was selected to sing the anthem at the U.S. Tennis Open in New York, and we had the privilege of taking her there and in this Arthur Ashe Stadium, the largest tennis stadium in the world, and her mom and I were just a little bit nervous, and uh, she got up there, and she gave all the glory to God, and she sang America the Beautiful as her immigrant father wept. Oh, how I wish my mother and father were alive to see their granddaughter sing America the Beautiful. Only God could do that. You see, they came here and immigrated when I was nine months old, legally, by the way. They immigrated <laughs> legally. Can we? Yeah. And oh, by the way, they assimilated as well. And had they not, I don't know that I would be standing before you today, let alone alive, let alone even saved. And I thank God every day that they came to America with 20 U.S. dollars in their pocket, and they worked themselves so hard. And for five years, they sought to get their citizenship. And on that day, they stood there, pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America with tears streaming down their face. It was a dream. My dad was quoted in the newspaper at the time who did a report on it, and he said, this is my new birthday, and he celebrated. I'm going somewhere with this, <laughs> at least I'm trying to anyway, because I want to come back to this, because this happened at the very time that athletes in a similar stadium would take a knee when the anthem was sung. I want to uh, read 1 Thessalonians 5.3. I know it's a verse you're familiar with, but as I do, I want to draw your attention to four words. And I also want you to take these four words and sort of put them in your hip pocket for now because I want to uh, come back to them in a moment. The Apostle Paul is writing by the Holy Spirit and he says, for while they are saying peace and security, here's the first word, sudden destruction comes upon them, the second word, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and here's the third word, they shall not, and the fourth word, and it's huge, escape. Sudden, them, they, and escape. Hang on to that. I want to come back to that. 
This brings us to the fourth reason, and it's that of the prophetic birth pains that are increasing in frequency and intensity. Now, I'm keenly aware that there are those who hold to the belief that we've always had earthquakes, we've always had, you know, catastrophic events and hurricanes and natural disasters. And there are others who believe that actually the birth pains will start when the seven-year tribulation starts. And I get that. However, I am personally of the belief that the size and scope of what we're witnessing today is indeed the fulfillment of the beginning of those birth pains. And the first time we see that or hear that referenced or used as a comparison is by the Savior himself in Matthew's Gospel, and it's in the 24th chapter. Again, I'll just reference it. You're familiar with it. Jesus is answering a question, actually two questions, a twofold question. The disciples ask him about what will be the signs of your return and the end of the age. And then Jesus proceeds to answer them by saying that there's going to be wars and threats of wars. That word rumors, as some of your translation renders it, can be better translated threats. So there'll be wars and there will also be threats of wars and then there'll be nations rising up against nations. And then he goes on to describe how there's going to be famines and earthquakes and they're going to be like birth pains that will come in greater frequency and greater intensity. 